Now let's have a look at the actual report of a peer review, the structure of a peer review report. Now, different journals have different styles. Some might have a free form style where you just supply uh, your own essay or your own document, but some journals uh, have a very structured score sheet. So it could be a scoring system, it could be tick boxes, or it could be a questionnaire. And these will look at things like the quality of the study, the quality of the presentation. For those journals that look at the journalistic things, they will ask for novelty, uh, potential size of impact, importance, scope, and how urgent you think the findings are, as well as the overall recommendation of the reviewer for the editor on whether the paper should be published, and there might be a ranking system too. Now, some journals send this score sheet to the authors and some don't, but your job as the reviewer is to keep to the deadline and keep everything confidential. The second part of a report, or some journals only have this, is a form. It could be a Word document or an online form that you enter into a, an online system. And this has two parts usually. One is a message to the authors and one is a message to the editor. Now, to the authors, you begin with a summary paragraph of what you think the key message of the paper is. And here you list major points, major strengths, and major weaknesses. Now, this includes big things like the technical soundness, the robustness of the analysis, the validity and reliability. We spoke about this in the first webinar. And the quality of the English language and the illustrations. Now, you might be asked to just write an essay or to number your points. Numbering is easier for the author to reply to, but if you do write an essay, then you could use subheadings for the strengths and weaknesses and for the author to understand more quickly. But the author then will have to take each sentence apart and address each point. Now, the other section in this part is minor comments, where you can list things in a numbered list. And this is sometimes called point by point, where the author will address each point and just give an answer to each question. For the confidential part to the editor, the authors won't see these comments. So if you noticed you have a potential conflict of interest by the time you read the end of the paper, or you asked for permission from the journal if your colleague or a fellow researcher can help you write the report because uh, you don't understand a part of a method or statistics, then you need permission from the journal and then you say that someone else helped you write the report. Or if you didn't review parts of the report because the, it was too technical, again, you have to say this in this confidential part to the editor. You might have the option to sign the report and make your name known to the author or other reviewers or to the public, even if the journal uses a system where the author shouldn't know who the reviewer's name is, so single or double blind uh, re review, uh, you might have the option to make yourself known anyway. If you discovered an ethical problem or you suspect an ethical problem, then again, this is the place to write it, or if you if the journal does use a double-blind review system where the author shouldn't know who the reviewer is and the reviewer shouldn't know who the author is, but you found the name of the author inside the paper, then you can state this in this section that you realize who the author is, but then you can say you don't know him or her in real life, so you don't have a conflict of interest. The final part is your actual recommendation to the editor on whether you think the paper should be accepted or not. Sometimes you can include the article type, whether it should be shortened, uh, the number of display items or references, whether there's too many, and whether the work is uh, of interest so that it should become a news release and sent to newspapers. Then the journal might have a news release uh, publication department where they publicize your work for auth authors. Now, the summary section could look like this, where you give the title and author names, 
and summarize what the aim was and what the type of article it was and then what the overall conclusion was. So here, X aimed to assess the effect of online English dictionary use among chemistry students in Asian universities. This original article provides weak evidence that dictionary use improved, blah, blah, blah. Then give the strengths and weaknesses. The main strengths were the sample size and duration. And the weaknesses, this could be put as although the findings were consistent in both word recognition tests and composition tasks, several design features limit the study's internal and external validity. So this is a nicer way of saying there are weaknesses, and this is a useful construction whenever you have a positive point and a negative point. So notice the word although, and then the clause after although, which ends with a comma, by having it after the subordinating conjunction although, this clause is actually weakened in its effect or its uh, focus or its importance. This makes the clause after the comma a bigger contrast, so it's actually increased in importance. So the thing after although is weakened, the thing at the end is strengthened. So it depends on what you want to say. You can put good news first and bad news last, or bad news first and good news last, but it's always the last item which sounds more important. Now in the point by point part, you have two options depending on journal style. Sometimes you can just list in a numbered list your points with your line numbers. So line 70 says table one, but should say figure two instead. Line 80 mentions new online dictionaries, but please add the web addresses to the references. Some journals might use a table format. So you put the location in the first column, what line number, you put your comment in the second column, and then you give a suggestion and indicate whether it's mandatory or compulsory, or whether you don't mind if it's made or not, uh, it's optional. And there's a blank column for the author to make the response. Now you have to decide all the way through whether you say the author or you, and be consistent. And if you find something negative, don't blame the authors personally. Remember, that's a personal attack. Use other subjects of the sentence. For example, the study shows something, or the results don't show something. And you can use the passive voice. So you don't say, you forgot to do something. You just say, oh, the results aren't shown. Now, in the recommendation part to the editor, whether it's in the scoring sheet or in the uh, essay part, uh, sorry, the comments to the editor, you have different choices. One is unconditional acceptance. This is accept as is. This will be quite, quite rare, and the author doesn't need to make changes. Or you could have a conditional acceptance where you want the author to make minor revisions and it's usually the editor or journal office that will check that those revisions were made. Or you can say revise and resubmit and this will mean bigger revisions and this will require another peer review. Now, you can reject the paper, but with good reason, and some journals allow another choice, which is to reject, but suggest major revisions, such as another experiment, another test, or redo another analysis. Again, this will need another round of peer review. But of course, it is the chief editor who makes the final decision, so these are just your recommendations. But do give a reason, don't just say, this paper is bad. And don't contradict what you put in the part of the peer review report for the authors. So don't tell the authors it's a great paper, but then tell the uh, editor that you want it rejected. So here's an uh, example of a reason. So I recommend rejection because the study design has limited validity and reliability. Specifically, the training was not standardized and learning progress was self-reported. Now here's a quick peer review checklist uh, for you to use when you're looking through articles. 
just look for what is the goal and motivation for the study, what's the relevance to the real world. Is the advance a large one or a small one? Is the research question backed by a good literature review? Are the variables clear? Is the design valid and reliable? And are the methods clear? Is there enough detail for other people to repeat the work? Are the findings clear and the illustrations are professional? And you can do a quick check as a reviewer, usually in tables, just do a, a quick check of some columns. Do they add up to 100%? And if there are percentages in the text, does the author give the whole number, the whole group, the N for the percentages? Are the results, are all the results available? Sometimes there are supplementary files or the authors upload their data to a repository like Figshare or Dryad. And are the results discussed in the context of the literature? And are there other interpretations and explanations? Are the conclusions logical and based on the data? Are there limitations and implications? And also look at the length, format and relevance for the journal, uh, give advice for improvements and look at the ethics. And you can practice this in journal clubs if you don't do it already. Uh, get some colleagues and choose a, a recent article to analyse and critically think about and practice your peer review together. Now, I said there might be possible ethical problems, so we covered this in the first webinar, but it's important to go over again. So there might be problems in animal and human studies with the ethics in journals that use open or single-blind review, where the reviewer can see the name of the author, you might realize that the author has conflicts of interest or hasn't mentioned the funding source. Have you, do you recognize the work you're reading, so this might be duplicate publication. Have you read it before? Do the results sound a bit too thin to be meaningful? So this is salami slicing, where authors try to cut up the results into many different papers. You might recognize the paper because you've read it for another journal as a peer reviewer, so it's a double submission. So authors aren't allowed to submit the same paper to different journals at the same time. Look at the data, are they believable or too good to be true? Are the photographs believable or do you notice parts that have been copied? And also the text, has it been plagiarized? And these other things too, like incomplete reporting, misleading presentation, omitting findings, citation bias, and no registration for clinical trials, misleading conclusions, or lack of copyright permission. So COPE, or the Committee on Publication Ethics, has flowcharts to help both editors and reviewers when you're doing your peer review. And I'm a council member of COPE. Our website is publicationethics.org. So notify the journal if you do suspect an ethical problem, and don't pursue your own investigation unless the journal asks you to help. And if you find a problem early on, then don't write the whole peer review report. Do contact the journal office. So that might save you time, but it might be a major problem that it doesn't need peer review. 